Hey guys, Icy Cat here once again, and this time we're going to take a closer look at Ghost Recon Wildlands. A couple weeks ago at E3, I had a chance to sit down with the game and play a full mission. And now I'm going to share with you my insights with that playtest next. So before we get started here, I need to make absolutely sure that proper credit for this video footage goes to the owner. This is footage provided to me by fellow YouTuber Cor Ross. You can check out his channel at the link that's on the screen here. I'll also put it below in the video player's comments. The reason that I am showing you his gameplay footage and not my own gameplay footage is that only certain pre-approved people were allowed to record at a special session. Anybody outside of that could not record their gameplay footage. I don't really understand the reasoning behind that. We were all playing the exact same mission and the devs walked us through it. There was a dev that was one of the four uh, of the ghost team and the other three were players and everybody had that exact same experience. So I don't know why some people could record at a special session and others could not because we were all getting the same experience, at least from a gameplay content perspective. So once again, much thanks to Cora Ross for allowing me to use his footage. And another disclaimer on that is that Ubisoft asked him and so I will also extend that same courtesy to uh, let everybody know that this is alpha gameplay footage. This is not representative of the final quality of the game. I wanted to get this video out to you last week, but Rainbow Six kept adding changes and making new content available, so I had to keep up with that instead. So the mission we played was divided up into three sections. The first one was an area where you had to capture a person and interrogate them and find information out uh, for where to go for the final section but in between there's also a chase section where the uh, when you try to interrogate the target if you don't capture him right away and he actually manages to get away then you have to chase him down to this uh, location and take that over and then there's a helicopter that's kind of near there you get up there and go you know flying around a little bit too so everybody got to play the mission a couple of times. Uh, when I played it, my first time was a little bit of a disaster because, you know, myself nor anybody else on the team that I play with had, uh, you know, played the game before. So, you know, we were kind of figuring out, you know, how to play it and what are the game mechanics and things like that. The second time we did a playthrough, it went way smoother and the experience was, you know, a, a lot more refined because we kind of knew what to expect at that point. The first part where you can capture and interrogate the guy this was something where um, it could go either way. If you spooked the guy, he would run and you'd have to chase him down. Otherwise, if you were very efficient and very stealthy, you could manage to actually interrogate him at the site. I will say that the AI seemed a little lackluster in that response. Uh, when you would drop one, somebody might have a line of sight on that target and yet they wouldn't react. Now, they did make clear that there were some things going on in this demo that were not going to be the way it was in the final game. That the uh, the AI wasn't really, you know, turned up to maximum, you know, responsiveness. The recoil was like next to nothing on the guns. You were a bullet sponge that was pretty much invincible. You would get downed, but you could just be picked back up again. And even putting into a down state, you could take all kinds of hits before you did. In fact, we had one guy that when he parachuted out of the helicopter failed to deploy his chute and he just hit the ground and was put into a down but not out status. We just went over and revived him and picked him up even though he fell a couple thousand feet. So obviously these things were set up this way for the purpose of the E3 demo. You know, they said that we want everybody to be able to experience the game and play the game and get through the mission and kind of, you know, get a sense of, of what it is we're doing here. And so they, they said that those things were intentionally left that way for ease of access for everyone. Now, you may agree or disagree that that was not a good way to show the game. That's not the point at hand here. The point at hand is just that these were intentional decisions made for purpose of the presentation. Other impressions I had with the game were that the sense of the open world was really great. It, it feels a little bit like GTA mixed with Splinter Cell because you have the concept of being able to go wherever you want. The vehicles handle very much like the Grand Theft Auto vehicles did. Now, uh, there was a section where a helicopter flight was involved and the dev was actually the one that flew the helicopter. Our team was comprised of three random players and one dev. So that fourth man was the dev and he walked us through the mission, guided us through, okay, now we're gonna go here, now we're gonna do this. So it was a guided mission. But uh, so the dev was the one that flew the helicopter. I don't know how the helicopter flies, if it kind of flies in that GTA style, just like the vehicles drive. 
I, it seemed like it might. There was some times where it was frankly doing some rather unrealistic banking turns where like it should have been dumping people sideways out of the side window because it was now like completely almost rolled over on its side and it wasn't. I don't want the game to be like a simulator. There's no need for this to be difficult to fly. I mean, sometimes when you get into a game like Battlefield and you'd get into a jet and you'd be like, okay, getting into a jet is so rare. I don't necessarily feel like I know how to fly this thing properly. Like you don't want it to be like that. I want to focus on the mission and play the mission and not be distracted by like, am I doing the correct yaw pitch and roll? You know, like I don't want it to be like that hardcore technical, but I also don't want it to be like a complete fantasy of like, oh yeah, let's bounce this helicopter off the side of the building because it's not going to matter and let's roll it upside down and that's not going to matter. You know, like I want to see a little bit of realism in there too. It just doesn't have to be a flight simulator either. Unfortunately, I can't offer much perspective on that. It seemed to be doing some semi-unrealistic, you know, turns, but aside from that, I'm not sure how it handled. One thing that kind of made me scratch my head, though, was that when you bailed out of the helicopter, all four people could bail out of the helicopter and parachute out. So it's like, okay, what's going on with this helicopter? It's just going to kind of, you know, fly around until it crashes or something. I mean, like, we just seemed completely unconcerned with the fate of this helicopter when we all four of us jumped out of the thing. Um, so that seemed really strange to me. And I don't know what they're going to do about that, you know, mechanic wise in the long term. But uh, apparently you can bail out of a helicopter and just kind of like leave it up to its own fate wherever it lands or falls or crashes. So. The vehicles themselves, though, the, the drivable vehicles, did handle in a very GTA-like style, although they weren't as, as sloppy on like their turning physics and things like that. They played in a way that seemed to make sense, I guess is maybe the best way to put it. They felt easy to use, but it also didn't feel like they had like these goofy ragdoll physics animations on, on the vehicle driving either. That apparently was just reserved for some of like the falling and flying damage that, that some players would experience. But again, that was an intentional choice, so I won't hold that one against them until I see the final product. Let's talk about the drones a little bit for a second. So the drones are something that everybody had. You could throw them up. These would automatically spot enemies when you were within a certain range and you held the the cursor or the reticle over a target for a second or two. It would spot that target and then you would have that marked. Uh, this would also occur not only on drones, but if you spotted anybody with a sniper scope, same thing. And if you spotted somebody with your character's binoculars, they would also be tagged in a similar fashion. This tag would follow the characters around wherever they went, and it would stay pretty much seem to be permanently, at least for the duration of the demo that we played. Uh, I do have some, some reservations about this. I hope it is not that way in the final game. While I like the fact that you can target your enemies and have them preemptively marked for, you know, intel, you don't want to have 100% situational awareness at all times. You know, it'd be nice to see, like, maybe, like, a player has to stay on the drone in order for the target to stay tagged. That would be nice. But, I mean, in the situation that we played, like, everybody went through real quick with their drones, marked everything, got off their drones, engaged, and everything stayed tagged the whole time, no matter where they moved, no matter how much time went by. So it'd be nice to maybe see somebody like, well, if we want to have that situational awareness, maybe we have to dedicate one of our operators to always being on the drone to maintain the intel. Otherwise, if it gets off, it fades within 20 seconds or something. I, I don't know. You know, just maybe something... Uh, a little less forgiving than that would be nice to see put in play. Also, everybody did have a drone, so it kind of made everybody able to be an intel gatherer. Additionally, everybody had two primary weapons, and that was set up so that everybody had an assault rifle and everybody had a sniper rifle. This also posed a little bit of a problem for me because tactical choice was no longer part of the equation. Everybody could be everything. Everybody had a drone so they could gather intel. Everybody had a sniper rifle so they could be a marksman. Everybody had an assault rifle so they could be an assaulter. So you could be the jack of all trades for every situation no matter where you were. Was this set up this way just specifically for the E3 demo? Yeah, probably, but what does that translate into for the actual game? From what I saw, having two primary weapons is basically going to make it so that everybody can respond to every situation. So if we can all be the assaulter, or we can all be the breacher, or we can all be the sniper all at the same time, it's like, what's the point? I might prefer them to only have one primary so that you at least have a tactical choice you need to make. And I don't want to see classes. Like, classes are kind of lame. If you, well, it depends on how they do them. I should be fair about that. For instance, when I would play a game like Borderlands, I would feel frustrated. If somebody else picked the character I wanted to be, I was locked out of that class. Like, if I wanted to be the sniper and somebody else took the sniper, it's like, oh, great, I have to be the tank now because the other two people have already picked and tank is all that's left and I hate the tank, but that's all that's left. Like, I don't want that. 
but maybe if they did something where like Battlefield had classes and like, okay, well, if you want more than one engineer, you know, then more than one person can be an engineer. Well, that would be okay, I guess. But I don't know if they're going to have a class system or not. I don't think that they are. It doesn't seem to be set up that way. I haven't seen the final release, so I don't really know. The weapon handling mechanics themselves were super basic. Like I said, there was no recoil at all. Uh, these weapons were, well, I shouldn't say at all, but I mean, it was pretty much like something you didn't have to worry about. It was so toned down. And again, we were told that it would not be that way in final release, so please don't judge anything you see here as being what it's going to actually be like in the final game. Every gun had a suppressor that you could take on or off. These were dynamically adjustable, so you could be able to respond to any given situation if you wanted to go loud or go stealth. That was cool. I really enjoyed that, and I like that. The weapons that were applicable also had a select rate of fire, so if you had the assault rifle, you could go ahead and change the rate of fire you were engaging in. You also had the option on the, they had like this red dot sight kind of thing with a, with a crosshair uh, reticle on it, and you had the ability to change the color of your cursor. You would just uh, press the button and it would toggle between red or green. And this was really interesting because there's a lot of green foliage in the game, so then you might want to have the red one. But there's also a lot of these um, s sandy, like, redstone cliffs and uh, trails and things like that where it's a very, like, ruddy, reddish brown. And the red cursor could sometimes get a little lost against that background, so then you could flip to the green cursor and, you know, boom, it's very easy to see. So that was really cool. I liked that a lot. Additionally, you had some gadgets that you could use. There were grenades that I played with a little bit, and those handled quite well. There were some C4 blocks and some mines. I wish I would have had more time to play with those and experiment a little bit. I really didn't get a chance to do it. They were in the game, but I didn't have a chance to play with it because the dev was like, okay, and now we're going to the next section, and this is the next thing, now shoot that guy. So we were kind of kept on sort of a path on that. One thing I saw that was really interesting was that the AI for the NPCs was pretty cool. Uh, there was a point where we were in the middle of a village engaging in a firefight. As we were exchanging gunfire, some guards ran into a house to try to shoot at us through an open doorway. And when they did so, I began returning fire back out, but the NPCs that were living inside the house went running out the door to get out of the line of fire because, you know, now it was happening in the room they were in. And they came running out with their arms up above them and waving and screaming. And, like, I accidentally hit one because as she ran out, I was trading fire with the other person. And it just became this thing of, like, all of a sudden there was just people, you know, running back and forth just trying to get out of the way of fire. And it became chaos. That was cool to see. I really enjoyed that. Speaking of the doorways, though, I was not able to interact with any doors in this game at all. Doors were either something that were closed and you couldn't interact with, or they were already open and not something you could open or close once it was already that way. So it seems like, uh, I mean, there are doors, but they're just already closed or already open, and there is no, like, opening or closing of doors at all. That, to me, is really disappointing. If you're going to have a game that centers around being able to make tactical movements and tactical choices, having doors that are all already open or all already closed kind of takes out one of the key components of coming into a structure, you know, if you're assaulting it, whether you're doing it from going loud or going in stealthy, having that that option to be able to get close to something, having a surface closed, and then when you get up to it, opening it and then reacting, you know, to whatever is on the other side of that is a key part of assaulting a structure. I was disappointed that they didn't have that in Rainbow Six Siege and it was just these wooden barricade things. Uh, you know, but so they had a reason for that because of the, the breaching of the structure and the way they wanted to do that. And, you know, OK, whatever, that was fine. But here, you know, there's doors that are actually in the game and they're just fixed open or fixed closed. Not a real fan of that. And I hope that that changes. So one thing a lot of people give the game a hard time on now that they've seen the gameplay is they talk about the graphics downgrade. I'm going to explore a little bit of this in a future video, but suffice to say that there's good things and bad things about the graphics scene here. And first of all, they want us to know this is not representative of the final gameplay, so we don't know what it'll look like in the end. However, there are some very clear things we can tell about what we do see. First of all, everything is very saturated. There's good color. It pops. It's vivid. It's not dull or washed out. But it might be a little too much on the bright side. It doesn't seem like there's enough shadowy areas going on. It doesn't seem like there's enough dynamic range in, in that saturation. It just seems like everything's kind of full bright all the time in, in some ways. And I would like to see more shadows going on. You know, maybe they just need a little bit more global illumination in their lighting engine, or I'm not sure what the deal with that is, but there, there needs to be a little bit more depth in some of that because it does have a, a flatness to it. 
The draw distance though is absolutely amazing. Now you do have a little bit of, of level of detail popping uh, to a certain extent when you get closer to some objects. Although that's not something that we haven't seen in other games, but when you can see out into the very far distance, the amount of detail that is out there is absolutely staggering. And when you go up in a helicopter, you feel like you are actually thousands of feet in the air. You can see around you forever and you can see cliffs way out in the distance and fields from farmers and just all kinds of stuff. You feel like you are really, you know, hundreds or thousands of feet in the air. And when you skydive out, it's just, it's all, it's very beautiful. I, the, the draw distance on that game is absolutely amazing. There are some slight level of detail issues in transitioning those draw distances, but some of the scenery in the game is just breathtaking when you look into the distance. And I just have to give that in, an incredible amount of props. The thing that stood out to me the most though when playing this game was the amount of ways that you could go about completing a mission. So for the final mission, there's this village, there's some rebel prisoners there, there's some intel you're supposed to get to be able to figure out where to go next. It's a compound that you have to assault, but the compound is within a village. So it's like equal parts village, equal parts, you know, sort of base in some ways. And uh, you've got your civilians that are in the mix there. But the way that we were guided to approach it by the developer was that uh, half of our team would go up to a uh, watchtower on an overpass road and take that out and then kind of snipe down on the encampment below. And then the other two members of the team would breach in through a gap in their defenses in the wall and drop down and then infiltrate through that way. We had the option of freeing the prisoners or not. The prisoners, uh, because they were rebels, would they? We were told if we freed them, they would not go quietly. They would come out, you know, and uh, they would begin taking on the cartel. So things would get loud in a hurry if we freed them. They would. I mean, they were rebels, and they were gonna, you know, they were gonna fight if we let them out. We decided not to let them out because we didn't want to uh, blow the, you know, the infiltration of the mission. Well, the first time we did it, we blew it on our own. Uh, we wound up getting discovered and it, things went loud right away. But the second time we played it through, uh, we were able to maintain stealth a lot quieter. I, what happened was I actually wound up blowing the mission, not realizing something. We got about halfway through the encampment and we were trying to sneak up to where the intel was located. And we were going up a stairwell along a cliffside and I wanted to see over the stairs. So I deployed my drone to, just to get a peek. And I'm kind of thinking like siege, you know, before you go into a room, you send in your drone. Well, when my drone went up, they, they saw it or heard it or whatever. And then the compound was alerted. And I was like, oh, shoot, I didn't really think about that. One thing that really bothers me, though, is when you've got this drone deployed, as soon as you exit out of the drone view, you can then like it's like you don't have to worry about the drone. It's just like wherever it was, that's where you left it. And then the next time you want to throw one out again, it's somehow back in your pocket. Now, there needs to be some kind of a mechanic at play here. Either you have to manually fly your drone back in order to have it back or you know you need to then go to where you left it and pick it up or I don't know just something you know just to be able to have this drone that just is able to infinitely respawn out of your back pocket no matter where you leave it and what you do with it is a bit of an issue and maybe this is just one of those things like having no recoil on the guns and having very unintelligent responsiveness in the AI and being able to be you know pretty much invincible is maybe this is just a thing that was like well we did it this way for the E3 demo and maybe in the final game it isn't really that way but when we went in there, you know, we were having things happening. People were shooting through windows and then I returned fire and I jumped through a window and, uh, you know, smashed it and jumped through it and went up and got the intel. You know, we were taking guys out and that was how we completed the mission that, that second time. But we could have gone about this mission, frankly, so many other ways. We could have gone in loud straight away from the beginning and just assaulted it in an all out gun battle. We could have used a helicopter and inserted from above and parachuted down on top of one of the buildings. And then, you know, maybe, maybe two people would do that while one person flew the helicopter and then the, the other person manned the chopper gun and, you know, kind of rained fire down on the encampment and provided aerial cover. Uh, that would be another way to do it. Um, we could have captured a vehicle and then infiltrated the base by disguising ourselves as one of the delivery vehicles for this place we could have taken out the power to the facility. There were some generators and that would have knocked out the power. Now we played the mission only during the day. There was no nighttime mission that we were able to play, but maybe at night that would have knocked out all the lights or something, I don't really know, but there's power generators there that we could have taken to disable the, the power for the entire area. There were alarms on towers with uh, these speakers that would, you know, like the alarms would blare out of these speakers and kind of alert everybody that we had been spotted and put the camp on high alert 
and they would come after us. Well, you had the option of disabling those towers or you could shoot the power control boxes for them and then if somebody went to raise the alarm, nothing would happen. There were other things that you could do. You know, you could free those rebel prisoners, which we didn't do, but we could have done. And then, then we could have freed them and then assaulted, you know, based on, on that and kind of erupted that gun battle from within the center of the compound. And frankly, there's probably a lot more ways we could have done it as well. I just love the fact that there's so many different ways that you could have approached that. Even going back to the first part of the mission where we had to capture the guy, you know, you could take out the guys and spook him and he could run, or you could do it very stealthily and actually capture the guy so that he couldn't run before he got a chance to do so. You could do something like go in full assault and actually block off his escape route preemptively so that when he tried to run, like, he couldn't. I mean, there is just, I mean, there's like so many different things that you can do in this game. That player creativity is what I love so much about what this experience is going to give us. One thing I've been asked a few times is if there's a cover system in Ghost Recon, and there is not. You cannot take cover on any surfaces, not on corners, not on barricades, or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing that allows you to snap to a cover point of any surface. And I could see why some people would want it, and I can also see the argument against it. Personally, I'm okay with it as is, just because they also have in play a system that allows you to switch which shoulder you're looking over. So if you're trying to edge around a corner uh, and you can't quite see over it, if you toggle the button, you'll swap the camera coverage to the other side. And that might, you know, just looking over the other shoulder will kind of give you that better angle you might be looking for as you edge around a corner. I could really go either way. It doesn't look like a cover system is going to be implemented in this game, though. It's not in the E3 presentation now. I don't see them adding it in the next 10 months. So I think we just need to accept that there won't be one. Well, that wraps up my gameplay review for Ghost Recon Wildlands at E3. Once again, this was a guided demonstration of a very specific mission, only set up just for E3, with parameters set up for E3. So there was no recoil on purpose. There was, you know, lame AI responses on purpose. There was almost invincible characters on purpose. So please don't judge any of that based on what you see here. And once again, Ubisoft did want to remind everybody to let people know that this is alpha gameplay, not representative of the final game at launch. And the bottom line is I did have a lot of fun with the game. I am very excited about it. Really looking forward to getting my hands on playing the final build. There's so much potential out of what I saw here. This game is going to be a ton of fun to play cooperatively and I can't wait for it to come out. There are some things that I have a little bit of concern about. Many of those things I was told are going to be addressed and they were purposely set that way. But, you know, there's some other things that I'm like, hmm, I hope that gets handled too. But we'll take a closer look at some of that stuff as the game gets closer to launch. Also, don't forget to follow us over at Ghost Recon Radio. We do a weekly podcast over there, and you can check that out. We'll have our next one up later this week. As you can see, we've got that link posted on screen. I'll also put it in the expanded comments below the video player, and you can copy-paste that into your web browser of choice. And once again, another shout-out to Cora Ross for being kind enough to share his footage with me so I had something to show while I talked about it. In the meantime, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest news and information for Ghost Recon Wildlands. Additionally, you can follow me on IcyCat25 at either Facebook or Twitter. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. We'll catch you next time.